have all y'all here this morning. We had, uh, come to praise the Lord, did we? Uh, if you would stand up and uh, and look up on the, uh, we're gonna have the. Uh, yeah, there it comes. Uh, and let's sing. Uh, if you want to look on your book, it's page twelve. We're gonna sing, praise Him, praise Him. Stand up and let's praise the Lord this morning. Page twelve. Twelve. The magic number. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer, sing the earth, love, love proclaim, hail Him, hail Him, high strength, and glory, strength and honor, gives to His holy name, like a shepherd, Jesus will guard His children, in His arms He carries them all day long. song. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer, for our sins He suffered and bled and died. He our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Hail Him, hail Him, Jesus the crucified. Hail Him, praise Him, Jesus the guard of sorrow. Him, praise Him, Jesus, Jesus our blessed Redeemer, heavenly portal, loud with a land of ring, Jesus, Savior, reigning forever and ever, crown Him, crown Him, prophet and priest and King, Christ is coming over the world victorious, fire and glory unto the Lord belong. Amen. That's why we're here today. We're here to praise the Lord Jesus and lift up His name. What a great group together today in God's house here at Dry Creek. I welcome you. If you're here for the first time, thank you so much. If you're returning, thank you. If you've been here your whole life, thank you. I'm glad you're here today, and I know that God is glad you're here. I want you to take time for just a moment, and I want you to turn. I want you to greet somebody and let them know that you're glad God brought them here. Would you do that? Just take a minute and fellowship right now. That guy back there, Freya, Tom is his... All right, then. Okay, you can be seated if you would. Uh, take your uh, books or look up here and turn to page 329, Pyre in the Bud. We're going to do uh, first, second, and fourth verse. There's, there's power. Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's 
There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would your evil victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Calvary's tide, there's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you do service for Jesus your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily his praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. I thought that was Kathy playing over there, but it was her sidekick. <laughs> Turn to page uh, 444. I left to tell the story. I love to tell the story. and his love I love to tell of the story because I know it is true it satisfies my longing as nothing else can do I love to tell the story will be my thing
please stand and turn to page 153, and we'll uh, worship with our tithes and offerings. Uh, worthy of worship. and praise and in our incapable ways we try to just tell you that we love you and we praise you today we thank you Lord for, for being here among us we thank you for what you've done for us we thank you as we reflect on the blood of Christ why that story is so important because that's our hope of our salvation is because of what you did for us we thank you Lord for the service that you've given us already and we just pray your blessings we pray for your presence to be among us as we go through the remainder Take this offering now and use it to glorify your kingdom. Lord, I pray that you'd bless the giver. In Jesus Christ's name I ask. Amen. Thank
gave this heaven locked away the son of god was laid in darkness a battle in the grave the war on death was waged the power of hell forever broken the ground began to shake the stone was rolled
Whoa. Praise the Lord. Beautiful. I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm pumped. I'm excited forever. He is alive. Mm, mm, mm. Goodness gracious. Thank you, praise team. Thank you all for hard work and godly choices. Amen. Psalm 145. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me to Psalm 145 this morning. This is a psalm of David in celebration of all that God has done for those who've gone through trials and testing. Now, did you hear me? This psalm was a celebration psalm. It is a celebration psalm for all those who've gone through trials and testing. So let me ask you this. How about you this morning? Have you been there? Have you experienced trials and testing, troubles, difficulties, tribulations, whatever you want to label it, have you experienced that in your life? Raise your hand. Okay. vast majority of the folks here this morning. There may be some of you who are walking through it today. Now, <laughs> you say, well, Brother Joe, you just said this was in celebration of those things that God has done for those who have gone through trials and testing. If I'm going through a trial and testing, I have a hard time celebrating anything that's happening in my life right now. I want to walk through several things that come out of this passage that I believe that are instrumental in helping us deal with the trials and the testings and the struggles of living out the Christian life. It's a beautiful passage of Scripture. In Psalm 145, it, David commends God's goodness, and he commends God's greatness, and he commends <laughs> God's grace. So you follow along as I read, beginning in the first verse of 145. I will exalt you, my God and King, and praise your name forever and ever. I will praise you every day. Yes, I will praise you forever. Great is the Lord. He's most worthy of praise. No one can measure his greatness. Let each generation tell his children of your mighty acts. Let them proclaim your power. I will meditate on your majestic, glorious splendor and your wonderful miracles. Your awe-inspiring deeds will be on every tongue. I will proclaim your greatness. Everyone will share the story of your wonderful goodness. They will sing with Joy about your righteousness. The Lord is merciful and compassionate, slow to get angry, and filled with unfailing love. The Lord is good to everyone. He showers compassion on all His creation. All of your works will thank you, Lord, and your faithful followers will praise you. They will speak of the glory of your kingdom. They will give examples of your power. They will tell about your mighty deeds and about the majesty and glory of your reign. For your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. You rule, you rule throughout all generations. The Lord always keeps His promises. He's gracious in all He does. The Lord helps the fallen and lifts those bent beneath their loads. The eyes of all look to you and hope. You give them their food as they need it. When you open your hand, you satisfy the hunger and thirst of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in everything He does. He is filled with kindness. The Lord is close to all who call on Him. Yes, to all who call on Him in truth, 
He grants the desires of those who fear Him. He hears their cries for help and rescues them. The Lord protects all those who love Him, but He destroys the wicked. I will praise the Lord. And may everyone on earth bless His holy name forever and ever and ever. Here David is commending God for His greatness, His goodness, God's goodness, God's greatness, and God's grace. And I want us to take a moment this morning and, and look, about each of, um, look at each of those qualities and what they speak to us when we're in the midst of trials and difficulties and when we've also come out on the other side to reflect on God's goodness, God's greatness, and God's grace. In Psalm 145, 9, it says this. It says, The Lord is good to everyone. Did you, did you get that? Did you get that He's good to everyone? Not just some. God is good to everyone. He showers compassion on all of His creation. Psalm 34, 8 says this. It says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in Him. Have you tasted and seen that God is good? Has He been good to you in your life? Amen. Praise the Lord. God has been good. God is good. Psalm 107, verse 8 and 9 says, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for His goodness and for His wonderful works to the children of men. For He satisfies the longing soul, and He fills the hungry soul with goodness. You understand that God is the source of everything that is good. He is the source of goodness. You could define goodness by looking at God, couldn't you? That's the essence of His character. That's the essence of His being. God is good. James 1, verse 17 says, Whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God our Father who created all the lights in the heavens. He never changes or casts a shifting shadow. You say, well, that's, that's well and fine, Brother Joe, but that's just that's hard to grasp because of what I'm facing, what I'm struggling with, what I'm dealing with right now. Maybe that's where you are today. But I want to tell you, it doesn't matter what you're dealing with today. It does not change the fact that God is still good. Psalm 31, verse 19 says, How great, how great is the goodness you have stored up for those who fear you. You lavish it on those who come to you for protection blessing them before this watching world. God's goodness is available even in the midst of difficulties, even in the midst of trials. Our problem, our problem is this. When we're facing difficulties and trials, where is our attention focused? It's on everything that's going on right in my life at this moment. All that I'm facing, all that I'm struggling with, that's where my, my thoughts are. That's where my focus is. But I'm remind, I want to remind you that, again, it does not change God's goodness at all. If we could simply take our eyes and refocus them on the things of God and on God Himself and the goodness of God, I promise you it changes your perspective totally and completely. There are those... One of the writers of several of the psalms that we, we've read is a man by the name of Asaph. And in the 73rd psalm, he was accredited for the writing of that psalm. And in it, he begins by affirming God's goodness to Israel, and he equates it, his goodness, with material things, with the absence of pain, difficulty, trouble, sorrow, illness, or poverty. 
And you know, we have a tendency to do that too. We have a tendency to believe that the goodness of God is reflected in all that is positive. The material blessings of life. People who look at that and look at Scripture and, and, and take it in, and bend it in that fashion would take Jeremiah 29, 11, with a bent toward teaching that God's goodness is expressed in prosperity and material riches. You remember Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, they're plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. If things don't go the way we plan, if bumps come along in the road of life, if there are falls and failures, does that mean that God is no longer good? When adversity strikes, has God's goodness failed? No! It's because of the goodness of God, that God will allow something positive to come out of a ne negative situation or circumstance. But fortunately, when you read through the entire Psalm 73, the writer comes to a different conclusion than he began with. He understands the goodness of God in a very different way by the time he gets to the 28th verse. You see, it's not physical, it's not prosperity, but he refers to it as the nearness of God. Psalm 73, 28 says in the New King James Version, it says, but as for me, God's presence is my good. I've made the Lord God my refuge that I may tell all thy works. The NLT translation states it this way. He says, But as for me, how good it is to be near God. I've made the Sovereign Lord my shelter, and I will tell everyone about the wonderful things you do. Nearness to God. Intimate fellowship with God. It's the highest good that we can hope for. The highest good that's attainable. What's the scripture passage say? God says, draw near to me, and what? I will draw near to you. Can you think of any greater good you could experience than the goodness of God, than the very presence of the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the creator of all the universe, walking with you, listening to you? carrying you when you face the difficulties and trials. When God allows suffering and adversity into our lives, oftentimes our confidence in His goodness becomes undermined, but it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. Instead, we should be reassured of His goodness when we realize that He's there walking with us. We're reminded time and time again that God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I'll be with you wherever you go. Now that's the goodness of God. David in Psalm, in the 145th Psalm, talks about the greatness of God. In verse 3 he says, great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. No one no one can measure His greatness. How would you do that? How would you measure the greatness of God? It's an impossibility. Psalm 48.1 says, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in His holy mountain. So let me ask you this. How big is your God? How big is your God? Is He big enough to handle all the things that come into your life? Is He big enough to pick up the pieces of a shattered family or a shattered life or a struggle in your life? Just how big is your God? 
Psalm 147, verse 5 says, How great is our Lord. His power is absolute. His understanding is beyond comprehension. You know what? what, what, Let me give you a paraphrase. God knows more than you do. Duh. Doesn't take much, does it? God knows more. God's power, God's greatness. God's greatness can be found in several qualities. One of those is the great power. His great power is boundless. There are no boundaries to it. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20 says, He is able to do exceedingly and abundantly more than we think or ask. I don't know about you, but I can dream big. And I can ask big. But God's Word says that, (laughs) basically, He says, what I dream for and what I ask for and what I look for is is nothing in the vast sea of God's greatness and what He offers. His great power is boundless. His great wisdom is infinite. Infinite. Did you realize how many, (laughs) on a clear day, a clear night, when there's no clouds in the sky, about how many stars do you think you could count in the sky? In any place in the world, any, any position in the world that would give you a vantage point of, of the stars in the heavens, how many stars do you think you could count? No matter where you are, the most you would ever be able to count is about 3,000 stars. And some of you are going to go home tonight and you're going to walk outside and you're going to start counting, aren't you? No, it's going to take a lot of time. Let me just tell you, scientists estimate that the universe contains at least, at least, 70 sextillion stars. (laughs) Who wants to know what a sextillion is? It's a bunch of zeros, Shelby. Absolutely. It's absolutely 70,000 million, million, million. That's what a, that's the number of stars that's estimated. Now let me let you know how many zeros that is. That's 7 plus 22 zeros behind it. That's 10 times the numbers of the grain of sands on the earth. Now you tell me that you don't serve a God that is great. You say, well, Brother Joe, who in the world would want to count stars anyway? Let me tell you, Psalm 147.4 says this. It tells us that God counts the numbers of stars. And he names them. You see, his great power is boundless. His great wisdom is infinite. And his great love is unending. Jeremiah 31.3 says, Long ago the Lord said to Israel, I have loved you, my people, with an everlasting love, with unfailing love, I have drawn you to myself. God's love for man is a love that knows no boundaries. He loves us constantly, and He loves us completely. It's a love that can never be broken by us or by Himself. His love is boundless. It's eternal. Don't ever, ever forget the awesome truth that God loves you. You see, when we're facing difficulties, when we're struggling with life, and things just don't seem to be going our way, we lose sight of that. Again, because... I'm I'm looking at this 18-inch circle that I'm standing in, and all I see is the problems that are are, are right there at my feet and in my mind. And I can't step out of the circle because I'm so focused here, and God's out here saying, I'm right here. Step into my circle. Step into my presence. 
Remember, the nearness of God is the greatest, higher, highest good that you can experience. The greatness of God is a great power that is boundless. It's a great wisdom that's infinite. It's a great love that is unending. And it's a great, unfaith- it's a great faithfulness that is unshakable. God's faithfulness cannot be shaken. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 23 says, Great is His faithfulness. His mercies are new. When? Every morning. His mercies are new every morning. Wake up, God's mercies are right right there. Brand spanking new for a new day to walk with you, to hear you, to listen, to share with you. That's God's greatness. That's God's goodness. God's grace. The psalmist speaks of God's grace in Psalm 145, 17. He says, The Lord is righteous in all His ways. He says, gracious are His works. In the New Living Translation, it says that filled with His kindness. You know what grace is, don't you? Grace is unmerited favor. God looks down and doesn't see your problems, doesn't see the difficulties. He sees the heart of a child that he desires to be in a relationship with. You see, the, the grace of God, first and foremost, is a redemptive grace. His grace redeems us. Ephesians 2 verse 4 says, But God is so rich in mercy, He loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, He gave us life when He raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you've been saved. There's nothing. There's nothing you could do. There's nothing that you could say. Your goodness is as filthy rags. There's nothing. But God looks down with that goodness, with that greatness, with a loving heart. And He offers the grace of redemption. His grace redeems us. His grace also sees through us. It does. He sees the needs. He knows what's going on. You remember Paul? Remember what Paul struggled with? He referred to it, Paul referred to a thorn in the flesh. And that's been debated for years as to exactly what that is. And no, it's not his mother-in-law, okay? He wasn't married. And so it, yeah, it, it, he, he, he begged the Lord. It says in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 that he begged the Lord three different times to remove this thorn in the flesh. Thorn in the flesh, wouldn't you believe that to be a trial, a struggle, a difficult time in this season of his life? Begged him. You think, well, you know, Paul, that's the Apostle Paul. Surely God would do that. Let me tell you what God's response to Paul was, remind you of what God's response to Paul was. He told him, he says, each time he asked, God said this. He says, my grace is all you need. My grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. Man, could you imagine what life would be like if we could ever attach ourselves to that understanding and realize that God would use our own weaknesses, that we don't have to have it all together. We don't have to have all the answers. All we have to have is an obedient heart and a willing spirit to walk in His grace. His grace redeems us. His grace sees through us. And I can't help but think of the song that we sing that was written by John Newton. It's pretty amazing. A grace, a graciousness of God that is truly, truly amazing. You see, that's what excited Paul. That's what kept him going despite all the hardships that he had to endure. And don't you think it ought to motivate us too? 
It ought to drive us to our knees and drive us closer to His presence. You see, prison for Paul was nothing in comparison to the hope of heaven. Nothing in comparison to being chosen by God. Nothing in comparison to being a a member of God's family through adoption. Nothing in comparison to the unmerited favor of forgiveness. What about you? Where are you today? Are you in the midst of a trial, a struggle, a testing? Or can you look back on something that you've walked through and you've seen the hand of God literally carry you out of it? Have you tasted of the goodness of God? Have you tasted of the goodness of God? If you have, Let me encourage you to savor the flavor of God's goodness in your life. Have you experienced the greatness of God in your life? Let me challenge you this morning to remember that He is able to do exceedingly and abundantly more than you can think or ask. Are you living in the sufficiency of God's grace today? Is it really God's grace? Is it really all that you need? God's Word says it is. That's what God told Paul. My grace is all that you need. Maybe you're here today and some of what I've spoken about just didn't resonate with you, that you, you haven't connected with it. Maybe that's because that it's something that you've heard about, but not something that you've personally experienced. God's goodness and God's greatness and God's grace. Well, can I tell you, can I, can I be bold enough just to say, if you find yourself in that position today, let me just tell you that God has shown you Today, His goodness and His greatness and His grace by bringing you here today. And God's word for you today is is simply His arms are open to you. And He's saying, come, taste and see. Come and experience the power of my greatness and come walk in the sufficiency of my grace. Would you be willing to come? In just a minute, we're going to sing a hymn of invitation. An invitation here at our church is always open. We use the end of a service as a time to, uh, to respond to what God has said to each and every one of us. And the truth is we respond Every week, whether we receive what God has said and apply it to our lives and we walk out in new principles of existence or whether we simply acknowledge, yeah, that God spoke. It was good. That was somebody else. But we all respond in our own personal form or fashion. But we want to give you an opportunity. Maybe you're here today and you need somebody to pray with you. I would love it. I would be honored to be able to pray with you. There are others who would willingly offer themselves to pray with you. I would encourage you. And I would invite you to come as we sing this hymn of invitation and that you make your way to the front. And if you want to come and kneel at the altar and just simply call on the, the goodness and the greatness and the grace of God, please do so. Father God, in this moment, in this time, Father, we give this time to you. And we ask, Lord, that you take the words that have been spoken, your words, Father, and Plant the seeds in the hearts that, Lord, have received them. And, Lord, in your time and in your way, Lord, grow what you want to see happen in the lives of your people. Father, I know that there are people here today that are walking through some tough times. God, show them today 
your goodness. Show them today your greatness. Show them today your grace. God, there may be somebody here that does not know you as Lord and Savior, and today may be their day of salvation. God, I pray for them right now, in this moment, that you would give them the courage to step out and come. Come to you, Father, for you're inviting them into a personal relationship. We would give you the honor and the glory for all that you would do in this moment, this time, in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would stand, please, and turn to page 536. Have faith in God. Have faith in God when your pathway is lonely. He sees and knows all the way you have trod. Never alone are the least of his children. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. He's on his throne. Have faith in God. He watches o'er his own. prayers are unanswered your earnest plea he will never forget wait on the lord trust his word and be patient have faith in god he'll answer yet have faith in god he's on his throne have faith in god he watches o'er his own 